Now, when we get into this topic of baptism, um, I, I would just ask you to stay with me on this because for some of you, you may go, baptism, yawner. Well, I hope that's not the case. Uh, and I, I want to start off by saying that baptism is one of those topics that some people have this sort of um, ir irrational, emotional tie. I mean, baptism for some people evokes very strong emotions. Let me tell you a story that happened about three or four months ago. I was down at the local county establishment, also known as the jail, and I went down to see a guy who had been attending our church, and he got himself in some trouble. So I'm in this, like, I'm inside the jail, so I can't get out without the police letting me out. And, but I'm in this kind of, like, holding area, and there were three of us. There was a female prisoner, and there was a male prisoner. Now, the female prisoner, she just kind of looked and smiled and nodded, and I said hello. The guy creeped me out immediately. There was just something about him that was like, dude, I'm so glad you're here. And, uh, I mean, the eyes were like just, and, and all of a sudden, he started to get up and move toward me, and all the nonverbal body language of the girl is like, watch out, you know, rah, rah, rah. the psycho meter is like really high. So he comes right up to me, and I'm like, security. He gets right in my face. You know, you know when you burst that, like, two-foot bubble? He's right in my face. Here's what he says to me. Kid you not. Baptism. Do you sprinkle them or dunk them? It was like... First of all, I'm like, how did he even know I was a pastor? And do I have that, like, pastor look? Obviously, I do. You know, but... So... So I'm thinking about this, and I'm, 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 in my mind I'm going, my answer to his question could either make me a friend or I could die right here. And if the guards told me later, I mean, this guy just, you know, he's just, he's not even remotely walking with God at this time in his life, but somewhere in his past, this baptism issue, this was not an emotionally neutral topic for him. And I'm thinking, if I am not on the right side of his theological fence, I may as well tell him a fat joke about his mama. I mean, this, this was serious stuff. So, as we talk about baptism, can we agree to approach this with a loving, humble, teachable heart? I mean, in the uh, outside chance that I uh, bring some information that's different from your uh, background, please don't assume that I'm attacking your religious heritage. Okay? All right. Because Jesus gave us these beautiful word pictures, as I alluded to in my prayer, uh, bread and wine for communion and water for baptism. He, he gave these to us to remind us of his love and to unite us, not to create theological holy wars. So this morning, it's a simple message, kind of straightforward. I want to address two key issues. Number one, what is baptism? What does it represent? And secondly, why is it important? Now, uh, there's a common uh, statement that I often hear around Bay Point, and, and it's, there it is right there. So let me just read this for you. I hear this statement quite often. It says, I was raised in a church where we were baptized as infants. Just a curious show of hands. How many of you were baptized as infants? Okay, wow. I, I'd say at least half of us, okay? So that's why we hear this a lot. And then I'll hear people say, but recently... I gave my life to Jesus Christ. I have understood for the first time the truth about my sin and my need for a Savior. And so having recently trusted Jesus Christ as my leader and forgiver, I want to be baptized again, you know, as an adult. Now, in addition to that stirring up all kinds of interesting family dynamics, which I'll talk about in a moment, it raises the question, what really is baptism? What does baptism represent? And hopefully, as we go through this, this today's message, which will be available on CD, I'm hoping that that becomes a helpful resource because here's another phenomenon that I've experienced over the years. It's not uncommon for people who make the, the kind of statement you just read to be in their 20s or 30s or 40s. They come to Bay Point having long ago walked away from the faith in the church of their, of their childhood. They come to a church like Bay Point. They hear the message of salvation, of how we can have a right relationship with God, and that it's through faith in Jesus, not our good works. It clicks. 
they give their life to Christ, they become his follower, and then they want to be baptized. Now, you would think that once mom and dad hear about that, mom and dad would be really excited. Oftentimes they are, sometimes not. Sometimes it evokes a response from the parents that sounds something like this. It's bad enough that you left the church that we raised you in and embarrassed us. I mean, and now you're going to some community church? What is that? Is this some kind of cult or something? I mean, it wasn't it good enough for you to be an Episcopalian or a Methodist or a Presbyterian or whatever? And now, and now you want to get baptized again like the first one didn't work? How could you do this to us? Don't you love us? And it all gets kind of like weird and emotional and somehow it's really about mom and dad now instead of what God's doing in your life. And so if you are the mom and dad listening to this by CD, first of all, thank you for loving your children and actually even caring enough about this issue that, that is important to you. But I want to assure everybody, we are not some crazy cult. We're not going to steal your sons and daughters. I'm just going to try to lay out as clearly as I can our understanding of the what's and the why's of baptism. And I think a good place to begin would be to define terms. The word baptism was actually a common non-religious word in the first century. It was just an average word. It comes from the Greek word baptizo. Who would have thunk? Baptizo gives us the English word baptism. It has a variety of meanings, but generally it means to soak, to immerse, to dunk, to saturate, or to drench, all right? Now, again, it was not uh, a religious word. It was used if a ship was sunk at sea, the ship was baptizoed. If a person died by drowning, they were baptizoed. It was used to describe a person who was in debt up to their eyeballs. It was also used to describe the trade of a fuller who would baptizo cloth and put it in a colored dye so it would go in one color and come out another. They baptizoed the cloth. We found in an ancient uh, Hebrew manuscript, it was also used in reference to the dunking of Oreo cookies in milk. Everything I just said except the last one is true, all right? But again, baptizo was not a religious word. It was just an everyday word describing everyday activities, but it always communicated this idea of being, uh, idea of being drenched or immersed or soaked. Now, around the time of Jesus, as uh, archaeologists were doing their excavation, they found in the period Jesus lived, they found a guy named Nicandor, and he was a physician, but he was also something of a cook. And in his cookbook, they found the recipe that he had for making pickles. And in his recipe for making pickles, they found the word baptizo. And he said what you had to do is you had to take the vegetable, the little cucumber, and you had to baptizo the cucumber for five weeks so that the pickle became pickled. I thought, five weeks, they baptizoed the pickle, and I thought, maybe that's the problem with modern-day baptisms. We don't keep them under long enough. <laughs> so, so I'm thinking, we baptize you in the name of the Father. So what do you think about the Tigers? They're on a six-game winning streak. Verlander threw a no-hitter, almost had another shutout yesterday. Man, this guy's got it going on. Bonderman had no, no decisions in the first five and has won eight in a row. In the name of the sun. Speaking of the sun, isn't the weather unbelievable this June in Traverse City? Meanwhile, the person's under the goal. Some of you were thinking about being baptized, and you're thinking again, aren't you? Now, until the days of the New Testament, as I said, baptizo was not a religious word. But then what happened, right before Jesus came on the scene, they started, the Jewish people started to baptizo to baptize non-Jewish people who wanted to convert to Judaism. So these Gentiles, Gentiles are anybody who's not Jewish, they would eat a ceremonial meal, they would have to kind of get their life morally cleaned up by obeying certain laws and principles, and then to seal the deal, 
these non-Jewish people would walk into the water, they would baptizo themselves. And it was a way of renouncing their Gentile, non-Jewish life, and they would come out of the water, symbolically now, as Jews, having embraced Judaism. But when you come to the New Testament, there's an interesting shift that occurs. A guy by the name of John appears on the scene, preaching out in the wilderness. Now, John was a religious wild man. Fiery eyes, crazy hair, like bedhead meets afro, you know. And, and he, uh, he ate bugs. He, th that's a locust. He ate those things. Now, in the outside chance, there's some, like, nutritionist who knows that there's, like, uh, antioxidant, you know, nutritional, high protein and eating locusts, whatever, they're disgusting and he ate those things, all right? He also dressed himself in camel's skin. That's just kind of weird. I mean, I'm thinking that here comes some like Bedouin group through the desert and some camel comes to the end of its life and dies and John goes, can I have the skin? Just kind of <laughs> strange to me. But, you know, so he eats bugs, he dresses in camel skin, but he preached this radical message of repentance, primarily addressing it to the religious elite of Israel. Now, check out this statement. This is in, you know, there's four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This is the second Gospel, Mark chapter 1, verse 4. And this is what's written about John. It says, and so John came baptizoing, baptizing in the desert region, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And so really what John was saying to the people of Israel in general is like, get ready, folks. The Messiah is coming. You need to repent. And just because you're Jewish, you think just because you go to services at the temple or because you're circumcised that your life is right with God, get real. You know it and I know it that your heart is a million miles from God. And you need to repent because the Messiah is coming. And you, especially, yeah, you religious types off, off, you know, with all your religious clothing, off kind of in the shadows, pretending like I'm not talking to you. Yeah, you know I'm talking to you. Yeah, yeah, and, and you, you have this appearance of being so righteous and so holy. I saw you last night at Dillinger's, uh-huh. And I know the theme song, not, not that there's anything wrong with going to Dillinger's, but they condemned everybody who, you know, would, would do certain things. And, and yeah, and I know that the theme song of your life is it's five o'clock somewhere, uh-huh. And, and, and now you want to pretend that you're like a cut above everybody and, yeah, yeah, you go ahead and run, baby. You tuck your robe between your legs and hightail out of here. But I'm telling you, you got to repent. That was John the Baptist. Laying down the smack, baby. Calling people out for their, their hypocrisy and for, as the scripture says, having the appearance of godliness but denying the power thereof. And the most amazing thing about John's message is that people actually listened. In Mark 1, verse 5, the very next verse, it says, The whole Judean countryside and the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. In fact, so many people came out to, to hear John preach and were baptized by John that John developed a little nickname. His nickname was John the... See, some of you thought that was his last name, didn't you? Like, which would mean the was his middle name. John the Baptist. That, that, that actually is a nickname. Now, here's why all of this is significant. Prior to John... Very few people were baptizoed. These were the non-Jewish people who became Jewish, but they baptizoed themselves until John. When John came along and preached this message of repentance, people came and they were baptized by John. Now, here's why this is important. When you were baptized by another person, what you were saying is, I am ident I'm publicly identifying myself with this guy, with his message and his ministry that had never been happened before it had never happened before people would have been going like what, what's going on people they're not baptizing themselves they're being baptized by somebody else and then after john people started to get baptized in another name and that name was jesus meaning again when people were baptized in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit they were saying i am publicly declaring 
my allegiance and, I, and identifying my life with this man's ministry and his mission. All right? Now, why do the writers of the New Testament borrow a common word like baptizo, a non-religious word to describe something so extraordinary and so sacred as baptism? Well, it's actually simple. It worked. To be baptizoed was a powerful visual way of saying, I am in. I am all in. I was thinking about, like, jumping off the stage at this moment, but after my fiasco last week, uh, when I, at the 9 o'clock, I, like, wiped out, I thought, I better just play it safe here. But, but it's a way of, of going public and saying, I am publicly identifying myself with Jesus Christ. Now, I'm aware that um, there are different traditions. Many of us were raised in a tradition where we were baptized as infants, and I, my guess is that if we were baptized as infants, we were sprinkled, not immersed. There is a New Testament word for the word sprinkle. It's rantizo. But whenever the Bible uses the word in reference to baptism, it's baptizo, which, which means to be immersed or dunked. Now, I come out of a Catholic background and then a Reformed background, so I, I understand all of that. But they're, they're symbolically, I mean, if you wanted to choose a word and an act that really kind of nails it, there is a difference between what? There's a difference between rantizo, which means to be sprinkled, and baptizo, which means to be immersed. You want to see what rantizo looks like? Okay, all right, it looks like this. Did I get anybody? Yeah? Okay, good. Now, I'm thinking to myself as I'm going over this, some of you are, are thinking to yourselves, that's why I don't sit towards the front, because like, you don't know what's going to happen. So, so for those of you in the middle to the back who are wondering what it's like to be rantizoed, it's like this. All right? Okay, now. All right, all right. <laughs> I got to tell you, I was practicing in this at the office this week. I walk, I'm in my office pumping this thing up, and I open the door, and uh, you guys know who Max Somerville is? Max is like the sweetest guy in the world and works on our traffic. He happened to be at the end of the hallway, and I hadn't used it, so I pumped it up. I just blasted him. <laughs> he had glasses on. I just, so like, like we're all good. Nobody's going to get mad or drunk. See, to get, to get like rantizoed is, it's like a sprinkling, and it, it's nice, and it feels good. It's kind of refreshing. But it doesn't quite have the same visual impact as this. Now, I see that guy sitting right over there. I could rantizo him from right here. That's big Bob Fernandez after his baptism. And, I, and you know... It's not ultimately about the quantity of water. I mean, if it was about the quantity of water, I'd just have everybody baptized under Niagara Falls. You know, I mean, let's just go for it. But I, I think there is something, as I've kind of worked my way through this over the years, that's very, very powerful. And, and there's, there's something beyond the quantity of water, and I'll, I'll get to it in a minute, as to why I believe that um, that word, baptizo, was used. Because it represents... Um, a point I'll make in just, uh, in just a moment. The New Testament pattern for baptism is always conversion first and immersion second. Faith is first. Getting drenched is an outward um, witness. It's an outward symbol and a public identification with what Jesus Christ has done inwardly. And I want to make this clear. It's possible to get baptizoed without getting baptized. See, if, if somebody just in an emotional moment, they get caught up in the motion, it's a sunny day in Traverse City, hey, other people are going in the water, let's go run out in the water and get baptized. It's possible to get baptized and never be baptized. Because baptism is an outward expression of a deep, life-changing, inner, personal encounter with Jesus Christ. So if you go down into the water, whether you're sprinkled or dunked, if it's not 
an outward reflection of an inner transformation. All you did is you got wet. Nothing wrong with getting wet, but it's not the same as baptism. Now, so immersion follows conversion. That's why, and, and, and this is one of these areas where we need to have a grown-up conversation because even as I say this, I, I come out of a different tradition from this. I, and I understand, I, I'm still largely reformed in my theology. But it, the reason that we practice the baptism of believers here and we dedicate children is because in Scripture, there does seem to be something about baptism that is tied to a cognitive understanding of the gospel. The people in Scripture who were baptized had gotten, they were old enough where they understood the message of salvation and our sin and our need for a Savior. And so then their baptism was was something that they did. It wasn't so much something that the parents did or the grandparents or the godparents. It was something they did that was an outer reflection of an inner commitment. To, to be quite frank and to be fair, child dedication, which we practice in this church, that, there's no uh, pattern in the New Testament for that at all. However, I think it would be uh, hard to believe that God would be offended by us coming together as a church and saying, can we pray for our children? You know, that God would empower parents to raise their children in a godly way. So if you read the statement that our elders have on baptism uh, that we've adopted, we've certainly adopted a, a position based on our understanding of God's word, but you'll also note in that statement that we have not, nor will we, make this a divisive issue. We're not saying we're right and everybody else is wrong. We understand that throughout history there have been different understandings of baptism. That being said, we want to be as clear as possible of our understanding of God's word and then remain as humble as we need to be. Amen? Now, let me move on to the, to the second issue, which is really, this is the kind of where it gets practical. Why does this matter? Why is baptism important? And it's, it's important for a couple reasons. Number one is it's ultimately a discipleship issue. It's not a salvation issue. Baptism does not save you. Jesus saves you. Baptism is an outward expression of an inner uh, conversion, but, but it's a discipleship issue. Think about these words of Jesus in the Great Commission, the very end of Matthew's Gospel, Matthew 28, verse 19. Jesus says, go into all the world and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, there are three words that are underlined, go, make, and baptize. They are all in the imperative tense. Uh, the reason that's significant is the, the, you know what an imperative is, right? It's like, it's not a suggestion, it's a command. Go, make, baptize. And here's why Jesus was all amped up about that. Because you say, well, come on, Jesus, is it really that big of a deal? I mean, maybe the going and the making, making disciples, but is baptism really that big a deal? Here's why it, it was a big deal. In the days in which Jesus made that statement, what major empire governed the world? Anybody know? It was Rome. And during the days of Jesus and afterwards, this cult of emperor worship began to develop, where Caesar made it a requirement of all the Roman citizens to declare, Caesar is Lord. Now remember, the very earliest confession of the Christian faith which is recorded in one form in the book of Philippians, is another three-word statement, Jesus is Lord. Now, one can be true, or the other can be true, but they cannot both be true. You cannot have two lords. Either Caesar is God or Jesus is. And so when a person in the first century was baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, they were publicly declaring two things. Caesar is not Lord and Jesus is. So when these first century believers got baptized, it was not, hey, it's a sunny day at the beach, let's go down into the water. Baptism was a risky, sometimes life-threatening public declaration that told the world... In the words of the Apostle Paul from Romans 1, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God and the salvation for all who believe, for the Jew first and then for the Gentile. So baptism was a way of saying, not only am I not ashamed of the gospel, I am honored to be considered a follower of the one who shed his blood for me. Take a look at this picture. 
You guys know who that is? Say it with me. It is the, the Blue Man Group. I have not seen them. I said at the earlier service, I've been to Chicago a couple times, and I've come very close to ordering tickets, but they're like 55 or 60 bucks, and I'm just like, oh, I'm too cheap. And I, I want to see them someday because I heard they're absolutely incredible. Now, I look at those guys. They're kind of like creepy, aren't they? It's like, what? So how do they get so blue? Do they have like a vat of blue paint and they just baptizo themselves right in it? I, I don't know how they do it. But I don't think they're ashamed of it. They don't hide their blueness, do they? No, they are the blue man group. Deal with it, baby. We're the blue man group. That's who we are. Similarly, when you are baptized in front of people, this is a way for you to say, I am a follower of Jesus, the one who shed his blood, who forgave my sin, who washed me clean, who has given me hope and life eternal. And I feel honored to publicly declare my allegiance and to say that Jesus is Lord. So it's a, it's a discipleship issue. Secondly, your baptism represents an entry point into a whole new life. And this, this is why I think that, that uh, it's more than quibbling about semantics with rantizo, you know, sprinkling, and baptizo, which means immersion. I think there's something else going on here. Baptism isn't about a new and improved version of your old life. Baptism represents a death and a resurrection. So let me be real clear on this so that we get this. God did not send Jesus into the world to fix you or to tweak you or to improve you. God sent Jesus into the world to kill you. How's that a motivator for baptism? God sent Jesus into the world. See, we love the idea of embracing a new life we love the idea of the resurrection motif, but in order to embrace the new life, you got to die to the old first. Here's what I mean about this death resurrection thing. For the people of Israel, water was a scary world for them. They were mostly a nomadic desert dwelling people. You think it was a walk in the park going through the Red Sea with Moses? Remember that in the Old Testament? The waters parted there like in their world, that's where Leviathan, the like the sea monster lives. In the days of Jesus, the abyss, the, the dwelling place of demons, they thought was in the bottom of the lake. So when the first century people went into the river and into the lakes to be baptized, this was not a walk in the park. They didn't have the talking heads on their iPod singing, take me to the river and drop me in the water. I tried singing that at the early service and I bombed. So I just, you know, you know, talking heads, you know those guys? Okay, maybe not. But the point is, is that baptism was a very, it was a, it was a joyful, but it was also a very solemn expression because it represented death and resurrection. This is why, by the way, that the Apostle Paul wrote uh, to the church at Rome in Romans chapter 6 about baptism in terms of a death and resurrection. Paul had just finished telling them that, you know what? No matter how dark and messed up you are, no, no matter how deep the sin is in your life, it's never beyond God's ability to reach it. So they were like, wait a second. If, if I sin and God forgives, should I keep on sinning so that God can keep on forgiving? All right, that, that, that was the issue. And here's Paul's response. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? And he says, by no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know? And, of course, they didn't. He says, don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of, of the Father, we too may live a new life. When you're drenched, when you are symbolically drowned and put into a water grave, you are resurrected into a whole new life. So this is not a bath. This is not taking a spiritual dip with Jesus. Baptism is a death to an old, self-centered, life is all about me life. And then it's an entry point into a whole new world that declares Jesus is Lord, and I commit my time, my talents, 
my stewardship, my gifts in community with other Christ followers. I commit my life to help as many people experience his love and grace and mercy as I have. So why is baptism important? Number one, it's a discipleship issue. Number two is it represents an entry point into a whole new life. And thirdly, it's an enormous encouragement to the Christian community. And let me just put it out, here, out there. There are so many people in this church who serve and serve and serve. They make coffee. They come to the office and fold programs. They make acoustical panels. They'll go out to the campus and paint. They write checks. They care for children in our children's ministry. They hang out with students. They're life group leaders. They set up and tear down the stage. They learn music. They prepare announcements. They serve. They do lights and sound. And they do all of this stuff. And sometimes we, you know, whether we say it out loud or not, sometimes we wonder, does this make any difference? Is it working? And then, like we will in a few weeks, mid-July, we gather down at the water, and people get baptized, and we hear their stories. And then we kind of look at each other, and we go, that's why we do what we do. So your baptism is an enormous encouragement. It's payday for us. Now, there are some other practical concerns that um, I have not spoken about, and we've captured them on location, on video. So for just the next couple minutes, take a look at the screen. Well, friends, here we are on, uh, on beautiful West Grand Traverse Bay, and this is the actual spot where we have our annual baptism service. And uh, dozens, if not several hundred, ba uh, Bay Pointers have been baptized here before you. And for those of you who are going to be baptized in just a few weeks, you will be joining literally millions of other followers of Jesus who have done exactly this. In fact, this tradition is actually a fulfillment of the command of Jesus that goes all the way back to the New Testament. So we're very excited about the step of faith that you're about to make. Um, just to let you know that uh, the waters here are clean, they're warm, it's about a balmy 90 degree water temperature. <laughs> But anyway, no, it really is very, very nice, and uh, it'll be even warmer in a few weeks. What I would like to do is address a couple of the common concerns that people have expressed about baptism. Probably the number one concern, even fear, is just the fear of appearing in public. Um, if public speaking is a concern, sometimes getting into the water and hair issues and makeup issues, those are real concerns, and we certainly want to be sensitive to that. But I think what you'll find when you get here is that you're going to be surrounded by people, you may not know them all by name, but they're really family and friends. And when you see people go down into the water and they come out, there's instant applause and hugs and tears and high fives. And so don't worry about it. This is not a fashion show. This is a statement of our public allegiance to Jesus Christ, and it's going to be awesome. So it's all good. Um, a second concern that some people have expressed is the fact that they were baptized as infants. And we understand that. That's the tradition out of which I was raised as well. But when you read in the Bible, every single case of baptism begins with a person making a personal profession of faith in Jesus. And then baptism follows as an outward expression of that inner commitment. So if you were baptized as an infant, we don't require that you be baptized, but we would strongly encourage you to do that because that then makes it very personal. You have personally trusted in Christ as your savior and forgiver, and now this becomes your own personal public declaration, both to the body of Christ as well as to the world around you. So we strongly encourage you to do that. The third concern that some people have is, what if I mess up? What if I do something wrong? And I just want to alleviate that fear completely. The only one who can mess up is those of us who are doing the baptism. We won't let you mess up. In fact, what we're going to have you do is we'll have you walk into the water. And just to uh, make you feel safe and secure, if you're part of a life group, invite them to come with you. If you've got family and friends, invite them to come with you. It will be a very intimate moment. We will ask everybody the same question. Have you trusted in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins? And then we'll take you down to the water. You'll be under the water for less than a second. And then we'll bring you up. And it'll be a time of great joy and celebration. So that's pretty much it. Now to demonstrate how a baptism actually works, 
I'm inviting Tim Homa, who is the pastor of student ministries at Bay Point, to join us. So, Tim? If everybody had an ocean across the USA, <laughs> then everybody be serving like California. So let's try that for real. Tim, come on in here. Now, dude, you got to admit, this water, a lot nicer than Vegas, right? <laughs> it's cooler. It's cooler. Well, here's how it's going to work. We're going to say to everybody, and I'll just say to Tim, Tim, have you trusted in Jesus Christ for your salvation and for the forgiveness of your sin? Yes. And uh, I'm going to instruct him to hold his nose, and I'm going to say, Tim, I baptize you now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and that's pretty much it. So the next step is for you to come down and join us for your baptism, and we'll see you then. Way to go, dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, let me just wrap this up by very quickly talking about next steps. If you are a believer in Jesus and you've never been baptized, the next logical step for you would be to go back to our information services table. We have a baptism registration packet. Basically everything you need is there. Um, one thing that I'm not sure is in that packet and I neglected to put on the video is, and this does get to the modesty issue. You notice that both Tim and I have t-shirts on. Um, so that, that's another issue why people are concerned. And so whether it's ladies or guys, you can wear your bathing suit, but just put a t-shirt on for modesty. And But all the information you need is in that packet there's also a sheet that we ask everybody who's going to be baptized to fill out. It's called My Story. And it just basically breaks down. There's three, like one, three one-paragraph sections. What my life was like before I trusted Christ. What were the circumstances that brought you to that point? And what difference has it made? And so it's very simple, but those stories are so rich and meaningful. If that is confusing or intimidating in any way, because it's designed to be very, very simple, but if you need help with that, call the office. We'd be happy to do that. But uh, if, you've, if you're a believer and you've not been baptized, July 15 and July 18, uh, that's when we're going to do our baptisms. July 15, baptism will be right after the 11 o'clock service. So we'll go down to the Senior Center right next to the Haggerty Center and the Maritime Academy. And we do the, uh, the uh, baptism at the, the Senior Center Beach. For those of you who can't make it on the 15th, we'll have another one that following Wednesday night, the 18th. So that's the first step for some of you. If you are uh, a person like me and many of us who were baptized as children, we d again, we don't require that you be baptized again, but if that would be a meaningful step for you, as it is for many people, do the same thing. Grab the packet. If you are a believer in Jesus and you've been baptized, I want to challenge you in two ways. Number one, I want to challenge you to be there because you need the people who are making that kind of public declaration. It means something to them to have their spiritual family. So really, make it a point on July 15. How hard is that? I'm asking you to come to the beach twice, all right? You know, way to suffer for Jesus, you guys. Uh, um, but the second thing is, is uh, maybe this is a time for you to ask yourself, are you, are you living the life? And those of us who have been baptized and declared our allegiance to Jesus, do those people who are closest to us, our family and friends and coworkers and so forth, do they know? Do they have any idea uh, that, that Christ is number one in our life? And, and if not, maybe this message becomes a chance for you to reassess and to think about what would it mean so that the faith that you profess and the life that you're living become, you know, knit together. And finally, if you're here today, and I hope some of you fall in this category, where you're not yet followers of Jesus, you're still trying to figure out the difference between Jesus and Muhammad and Buddha and Gandhi. And, and I, we understand that. And uh, we're so delighted that you're here. But if that's kind of where you're at, you're on a spiritual journey and you're trying to figure things out, I, I think the next step for you is to just come. Keep coming back. Come to the baptism service. Ask questions. You know, get with the person who brought you or call one of us on staff. We'll sit down and we'll have coffee and we'll talk about what does it mean to have a personal, life-changing relationship with God. So that's kind of it, and I, I hope many of you will make the 
the bold, courageous decision to, to be baptized this year. We're going to wrap the service this morning with kind of a trip down memory lane and a beautiful song. So watch this, and then I'll close this in prayer. So I'm, I'm hoping that will be some of you uh, in, in just a few weeks. 
before I close this in prayer, I just want to remind us of something. Um, think about, you know, getting beyond fears and phobias and self-consciousness about, you know, wet hair and, you know, makeup and all of that stuff. So just, just kind of put it out there and remind us that when, when they finished beating our Savior, he was nearly unrecognizable as a human being. And he hung and bled and died naked on a cross for you. And all he's asking is for us to be baptizo as a way of publicly saying, my first allegiance is to you. And I know that there are some times where there are physical infirmities that make a baptism like we're going to do at the bay nearly impossible, and we'll accommodate that, I, I promise you. But outside of that, if you have been born again, if you've been radically redeemed, if you've been loved and forgiven and given hope for eternity, I think it's time for some of us to get drenched. Amen? All right, let's stand. <clears throat> Father, thank you for these uh, amazing uh, signs like bread and wine for communion and water for baptism that are rich and full of meaning. And I thank you for the lives that are in this room that have come to a point where they're saying, that's a next step for me to kind of publicly put myself out there and, and to say to my Christian brothers and sisters, but also, in, in a sense, publicly to a watching world that my ultimate allegiance rests with Jesus Christ, my Savior, my Forgiver, my Redeemer. And I thank you for everybody in this room that's kind of on a journey and they're not sure about all of this and they're, they got a lot of questions yet and I pray that this would be a community that welcomes that and where we can lovingly engage in big time eternal conversation. So thank you for this gathering this morning, Lord, and uh, for the life that you have given to us for the forgiveness of sin, for the opportunity to be a part of everybody, for the reality that we can do things together we could never do on our own. God, just knit us together as a family and help us to be a prevailing force of redemption, not only in Traverse City and Northwest Michigan, but well beyond that. We pray this boldly in the name of Jesus, our Savior, and everybody who agreed said,